How are you doing at the end of a long but inspiring, alarming, and uh, hopefully energizing day? You still with us? <laughs> Great. So I want to begin by asking you to close your eyes for a moment uh, as uh, some of our friends hand out some wonderful resources for you. To close your eyes for a moment and imagine, just for a second, that we've won. You know, that the movement that this conference envisions has taken off, uh, that you wake up one morning and suddenly you know that we have done the curve thing, like coming up on the roller coaster, and we have hit the bottom of degeneration and are on the path of regeneration. What would that feel like? And what would you do on that happy day? You know, imagine your kids coming to you and saying, you know that iPad I've been nagging you for? I'm bored with it. I want to go out and work in the garden. <laughs> in places in the uh, heartland of America, those places that have been, you know, full of people overdosing on Oxycontin and fentanyl. You see young people tossing away their pills, going, what the hell are we doing? The earth needs us to be out there regenerating. <laughs> Somewhere in some parent's basement, some young kid who has done nothing but play video games for the last three years and scroll around right-wing websites, wakes up, looks around, and goes, what the hell am I doing? I always wanted to be a cowboy. <laughs> and suddenly there is this immense resurgence of energy and hope as people wake up and realize the earth needs us and we are important. Each one of us has a role to play and is vitally important in making this shift and making this happen. That's the movement, I believe, that we need to build and that we are building in conferences like this and in the amazing work that people here have spoken about that you are all doing. And as that movement grows and takes hold and catches fire, I believe it can and will transform the world. So. Uh, there's an old joke about witches that says, how many witches does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is, what do you want to change it into? <laughs> <laughs> and I think the same thing, you know, question is well worth asking about changing the world. We always talk about it, but what do we want to change it into? Again, I think we have heard the answer here from the very beginning is with Canyon's beautiful opening welcome and song and Tom Goldtooth talking about the need for indigenous wisdom and indigenous people to be in the forefront and take leadership. Yeah. I think what we want to change the world into is a world that is far closer to the indigenous worldview than the world we live in today. And that worldview is one that is relational. It's not a worldview of separate, isolated objects. Uh, it's not a worldview uh, that's instrumental or exploitative. It's a worldview of relationships. And its core is the understanding that everything is interconnected, everything is in, in relationship, we are part of those relationships, and what is sacred, you know, sacred is a word we hear a lot, and we often think it means, you know, something out there we bow down to, um, but sacred really comes from the same root as sacrifice. It's something that's so important that it goes beyond your immediate profit and comfort and convenience. It's something you would take a stand for, something you care enough about that you want to protect it 
and you don't want to see it desecrated in any way. Uh, when we hear elders tell us water is sacred, earth is sacred, sky is sacred, what that means is really, really important. And I believe that, at least here in this conference, we know that. We need to change the world into one where that is the core principle of all of our institutions. And I believe that is, as John Liu puts it, the great work of our time. So it requires a shift in consciousness. And that shift, I think, is actually underway in many, many ways. First of all, I want to just say that all of us have indigenous ancestors. To be indigenous, to have that indigenous consciousness and wisdom is not limited to any certain group of people. All of us come from people who lived in close relationship to the earth and understood that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have survived. This me mechanistic, instrumental consciousness is actually kind of a recent aberration. And I think it's also helpful to know the history in Europe, since it is Europeans who spread that consciousness and that culture around the world, of how that came to be, how we came to be severed from the European indigenous knowledge, uh, which goes again back to those witches. It's interesting, we live in a time where, you know, we hear the witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt over and over and over again. Um, but at the same time, we've actually completely forgotten what the witch hunts really were. And what they were was an attack on the ancient indigenous wisdom knowledge, herbalism, and worldview that came from Europe and from the Middle East and that underlay civilization for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, it was a time, and I don't have time to go into the whole nuances of all the history about it. Uh, I recommend to you an amazing book called Caliban and the Witch by Sylvia Federici if you're interested, because she does a brilliant job of tying the witch persecutions to the rise of capitalism. But let's just say that in, even in Europe, at the root of all culture, were the understanding that the earth is alive, dynamic, interactive, that relationships spread through the visible and the invisible world, through the living and the dead. Uh, that plants and animals had consciousness and had healing powers, and that there were people who were responsible for guarding and shepherding and caring for the earth and for caring for the people and using those healing powers. And that led to conflict with the power structure that said, well, actually, some people have value and other people don't have much. And those people are just here on Earth to serve the other people. And you better just be good and because God and heaven and everything is outside the world. So what you do here doesn't really matter. It's you're only getting points for some future life. Uh, that was a great ideology to keep people oppressed. And it ran into conflict with, again, that ancient understanding that we are all here, we're all in relationship. Uh, we are all in relationship with the earth and the environment around us. Uh, so there were peasant rebellions all through European history, over and over and over again. On the one hand, it's really inspiring to learn that history. On the other hand, it's really depressing because they all were put down, <laughs> one after another, until probably the French Revolution finally like overthrew the overlords. Um, but that sensibility, that understanding never was completely destroyed. And the attempt to suppress it involved, again, torture and murder and persecution, um, mostly of women, but also of men, that lasted over a period of about 300 years. And I think still haunts us today 
uh, when we start to approach ideas that seem to be somehow out of the box or somehow not quantifiable. You know, it still haunts us when we stand up and say, these things that are intangible uh, are actually more important than those things that you can count and count up and put on the bottom line. So, witches uh, practiced magic. And magic, I always like Dion De Fortune's definition of it, as the art of changing consciousness at will. So when I think about how do we make a change in consciousness, I go back to thinking about magic. And there's two parts to that. One is art. And art means vision. Uh, we have to have a vision of what we want and what we can create, and not just a vision of what we don't want. We need, at this time, obviously, you know, it's so crucial to stand up and say no to the incredible level of stupidity going on in the world and the cruelty and the viciousness by which these power structures are enforced. Um, but we also always need to know what we're saying yes to. And that's why I love this conference and this concept of soil, not oil. Because right there in the title, it tells you what we want not just what we don't want. We also have to look at how we frame the issue. And um, framing is something, uh, I think it's both a magical concept, but it's also a concept really well expressed by the linguist George Lakoff, uh, who's a political theorist, who talks about these overarching metaphors by which we understand the world and look at the world. And he's looked at our uh, current political landscape and said, you know, why is it people who are anti-abortion are pro-death penalty? You know, why is it people who are anti-death penalty tend to be pro-choice? <laughs> Where is the logic? And he talks about looking at the country sort of understanding the country metaphorically as a big family. And there's one frame that kind of sees that family needs a strict father to keep everything in order. And the world is tough, and people need discipline. And if they do wrong, they need to be punished. So if they're wrongdoers, then yes, they should be executed. But if they're uh, women who maybe have accidentally gotten pregnant, well, that's a transgression, and they shouldn't be coddled by being allowed to make a choice about it. Uh, then there's another frame that says, well, actually, the country's kind of like a big family, and a family should be a nurturing place where people are encouraged to develop their full potential, and um, where when people make mistakes, uh, they're taught, they're corrected, but it's in the spirit of learning, not in the spirit of retribution and punishment. And so in that frame, you know, capital punishment is uh, a violation of somebody's human rights. Even if they have done terrible things, uh, we don't lose hope that somehow there may be something redeemable in them. And we understand that institutions can make mistakes, uh, as we've seen with capital punishment and so many people on death row who've been exonerated when DNA evidence proved them innocent. And we support a woman's right to make choices about her own body because that's part of her autonomy and part of her personhood. So when we think about climate change, I think we need to look at how do we frame the issue. And I think it's vitally important we frame the issue not just as carbon numbers, but that the problem is massive ecosystem degradation on a global scale. And that ecosystem isn't just 
you know, the physical and the elemental and the wind and the water and the animals and the ecosystem is also us. It's the human ecosystem, the cultural and economic systems that interact with all of those other things. We live in this time of meltdown and what we're seeing is that climate change is a symptom of this massive uh, collapse of all those systems that sustain and support life and health. Um, the reason I think it's important to see it that way is because then it gives us an answer. The answer is massive ecosystem regeneration on a global scale. <laughs> And that includes human regeneration, social, economic regeneration. Uh, and that has to be on a basis of social justice. We can't have social regeneration on a basis of vast inequality, because that inequality, first of all, isn't sustainable. You know, imagine a forest where one tree held over half of the nutrients, right? That forest would be in bad trouble, right? You know, we can't have an economy like the one we have and imagine it's going to carry on. And part of that is because sooner or later, all of those other starving little trees and stunted bushes are going to be going like, hey, how come, how come that maple gets all the nutrients? <laughs> Let's go. You know, we're not trees, we're people. We have, uh, you know, the ability to make changes, to make demands, to fight, you know, let's take it down and let's change it. And so because of that, that inequality requires immense and ever-growing brutality and violence to try to maintain itself. So we cannot regenerate the world in a climate of violence and cruelty and callousness and hatred. Um, we need to counter those things. And again, I think the call to regeneration is one that's also a call to connection, um, to love for the earth, for the elements, for the plants, and also for the people, for recognizing that sacred spark in every human being and committing to a world where resources are actually shared and distributed because we know that's the only basis for a world that's really viable and really and truly sustainable. So where do we get to the strategy part of it? Uh, yeah. Besides being a witch, I'm also a permaculturalist. <laughs> and as a permaculturalist, we like to say that we are designers. Uh, we do ecological design uh, in order to create systems that can meet our human needs while actually regenerating the systems around us. So design implies, again, art and will, like that uh, magic of changing consciousness. Again, having the vision and then putting uh, the intention, the energy, and the focused work toward making it happen. Uh, so design, I think, and strategy are very similar. And when we do permaculture design, we start with a site analysis. We start saying, OK, we got place, we're going to design it. What have we got here? Uh, what, are our, what are some of the resources we might have? If we think about what are some of the resources we might have around climate change, um, well, we have something like, what, 97, 98 percent of all scientists, every scientist who's not in the pay of the oil companies, <laughs> that's a good resource. We have indigenous people around the globe. Two of those together should be pretty powerful. Um, we have people, like every person who kind of has a stake in the future for themselves or for their offspring or for future generations. 
Um, we have some governments, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're moving in the right direction, sometimes not, but, you know, we, you know, the state of California has done some very good things, and there's a lot of things it could do a lot better, but, uh, I always think with governments, it's sort of the same philosophy as dog training. You know, there's a philosophy in dog training that, like, you know, you're trying to teach your dog to sit, and you don't yell at them when they don't sit perfectly. It's like every move they make toward doing what you want, you reward them a little bit. So they twitch their haunches like, good dog, good dog. You know, they lower the back end, good dog, good dog. They sit, good dog, good dog. Yeah, you know, so it's like, yes, we should reward the moves that are being made in the right direction and support them. Uh, and then we can push them further because they need to go much further than they're going at the moment. Um, we have incredible tools, technologies. You know, we've been hearing about them all weekend. We'll continue to hear about you know, we, act, we know how to do regeneration. <laughs> we know what we need to do. Uh, I passed around a statement that the, came out of the International Permaculture Convergence in 2015 uh, that was signed by hundreds of permaculture groups around the world. And you can take it home and look at it. Uh, but it lists just, you know, a spectrum of the solutions. You know, we've heard it again. We need small family farms. We need to restore soil. We need to restore the water systems. Uh, we need integrated systems of perennials and grazing systems and annuals that are grown without disturbing the soil, but in ways that build soil. And if you imagine a world like that, you suddenly start to look at the world in a much more hopeful way. I want to tell you just one story. I was in India last December for the International Permaculture Convergence. And um, we got taken out to a site visit to a wonderful farm uh, that the Aranya organization, which organized the convergence, had been working in this area with farmers for 20 or 30 years, uh, Narsana and Padma Kapala had started this. And they worked in an area where people were impoverished, where they were malnourished, uh, where most of the land was devoted to GMO cotton, and where farmers couldn't make a living because the cost of the seeds and the inputs and the herbicides and the pesticides oh, that were so much they could never get ahead and never get above ground economically, and the ground was impoverished, they weren't growing food for themselves, the kids were hungry, malnourished, and a lot of people had no land and were forced to be laborers on other people's land. So they worked with the people first to get them some land, not lots of land, you know, a hectare or a couple of hectares maybe, you know, small little tiny farms. But on those farms, they encourage them to grow organically and to do all the things that we've been hearing about, to build soil, to build fertility, to rebuild the biology, and to grow an incredibly biodiverse set of vegetables and grains and trees and food forests and things to feed themselves first rather than for the market. And what happened was transformative. People had food. It's an unbelievable shift if you, from not having food to having food. They had nourishment. They had vegetables, which they hadn't had because they were expensive, and you had to go to market miles away, and they would go bad by the time you got them back. The women were empowered. Now the men had to come to them for food, instead of them having to go to the men for money and beg them to go to market and buy the food. Um, Pad Narsana worked with the men too and really told them, hey, we need to respect women. Women are important. 
So we met some of these women who now go around and are teaching permaculture. And they had created all these songs about permaculture and sat there singing those permaculture songs in their beautiful saris. And they were so happy. <laughs> and I looked at them and I went, it is possible to live in a world where this is the norm where people have food and have enough to eat and have joy in their lives and have community and feel empowered and feel like they have a purpose. It is not that difficult. It really requires, again, that shift in consciousness uh, and a little bit of help and a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of support. So we have tremendous resources and we have tremendous models of regeneration uh, if you saw John Liu's program this morning, you saw, again, those amazing places in China. There's places in Africa. There's places all over the world uh, where regeneration has happened. And dead, desiccated, poisoned land has been brought back into life and health. And that is, I think, um, a symptom. I think John said, you know, our landscape reflects our consciousness. When our consciousness shifts, our landscape can revive. <laughs> so, we looked at some of the resources. Uh, what are some of the opponents? Well, obviously, um, what Vandana Shiva would call the poison industrial complex, really. That's about it. You know, it's just Monsanto, the oil companies, all of those folks. That's what's in the way. Uh, but there's also beyond that, there's also what I think of as oppositional forces. There are less entities and more attitudes. You know, I think inertia is a big one. It's hard to get a system to shift off of the course of action and move in a new direction. Um, another one is the way in this culture ideas get sort of branded so that we're not really engaging with the reality of them or the right or wrong or the effectiveness of them um, or even the evidence for them. We're engaging in whether I'm the... You know, it's not like people are weighing the evidence for climate change and coming to a rational conclusion. I think I'm going, really, well, I'm the kind of person who hangs out with people who don't believe in climate change, so I don't believe in climate change. The kind of people that believe in climate change are different from me. And I think that is one of the obstacles that we have to confront. I think that's one reason why it's helpful to shift the frame a little bit and talk about ecosystem decline and degeneration, because that is something people can see all around them and are experiencing all around them. And if we can offer people hope around that, then it doesn't matter so much whether they define it as a climate change strategy or as a farm strategy or as an anti-desertification strategy. What matters is that they start to understand it and they start to do it. Another problem I think we have is human nature. Unfortunately, it is with human beings that we have to do this work, and human beings are really difficult. Uh, they also really can be really amazing and wonderful, you know, but we uh, have a resistance to doing things that are unpleasant, to facing things that are scary, uh, to uh, delving into the depths of despair and hopelessness and really confronting them. Um, in order to deal with that, I think we also have to look at those aspects of human nature that we can mobilize. And I think, again, if we frame this as uh, the move from degeneration to regeneration, 
Then we offer people something that speaks to a different part of human nature. We offer people hope, and we offer, offer people purpose. And I think part of human nature also is a huge, deep longing for belonging, for feeling that you are part of something, and a huge, deep longing to feel like you make an impact, like your life makes a difference. Like there is a reason for you to be here and you are needed. I think too often in the environmental movement we're telling people human beings are a blight on the planet. Well, I mean, you could look around and you could certainly make a case for that, but you cannot mobilize people around that idea. <laughs> uh, I think we do much better if we say, look, you know, Yes, the world is in a terrible state. It is probably worse than you ever thought. Um, but it could be better than we've ever imagined. And you have an important role to play in that. Whoever you are, whatever your gifts, whatever your talents are, you are needed to make this transition. Huh? Yeah. And to do that, I think it's helpful to look at change as an ecosystem. You know, again, often in movements we get involved in like, my path is better than your path. You know, you know why do you bother going to a march? It doesn't change anything. You should do direct action. Why do you bother voting? It's, you know, you should be out there on the streets. It's like, excuse me, we need to do all those things. And not everyone needs to do the same thing. We need people working on investment, like the people who are up here before. And we need people out there on the streets carrying signs saying capitalism is not the answer. <laughs> you know, we need a full spectrum. You can't have direct action that's effective if you also don't have people doing marches, like we had the other day, that are legal and permanent, but that help build a much broader movement and give a vaster group of people a chance to participate in something. Uh, we can't have a march that's effective if we don't have people doing media. And if we do have people doing things like making films and educating people and putting on conferences, then that multiplies the impact of having a march or having an action. So if we look at things as an ecosystem, then we can say, there's a niche for everybody. You've been in the basement playing video games, there's a place for you. <laughs> yeah. You know something from your life as a gamer that we need in this movement. So how does this work? Where do we put this into play? I've been thinking a lot about how do we look at something for example, our risks around climate change. Uh, in California, let's look at fire. You know, fire is one of the greatest climate change things that we face. Um, so what do we do about fire if we're looking at it relationally? Right. Um, first of all, we look at it and we say, we've got to understand that the big forest fires are not anomalies. And we also don't have to accept them as the new normal. We have to understand that they are the redress of an ecological imbalance that's been building up for 200 years. The indigenous people of this land managed the land beautifully with fire, burned places regularly. Our trees and our forests are fire adapted because of the tens of thousands of years of that elegant, interaction. Um, but we haven't done that for 200 years. And now we have huge fuel loads, and we have dying forests full of sudden oak death, and we have people living in the middle of them. Well, in permaculture, we say the problem is the solution. <laughs> um, we have people living in the middle of the forest, but we need people living in the middle of the forest if we're going to actually bring our forests back to health. Uh, we need people who learn how to tend them and manage them and prune them and heal them. 
And again, we, under, we have knowledge. We have understanding. We need resources. We need funding. We need policies that help us do that. Uh, if we're going to have people living in the forest, we need to look at prevention, around, particularly around structures, um, because that's where it impacts people and around people's lives. I had a long talk with uh, my neighbor, Carleone Safford, who is fire safety uh, coordinator with Fire Safe Sonoma, which is a nonprofit fire safe council. And she really bent my ear about structures, structures, structures. But that's where the impact comes for most of us. And where firefighters spend the bulk of their time. So if we, and we actually know how to design our structures and how to uh, help harden our structures and improve the safety and the odds that they can survive a fire. Uh, so I encourage you all, if you live in or around that urban wilderness interface, um, go home, read up on it, look at it, and start to clean up your own act because fires are part of what we live with here in California, and we need fire. Um, we might look at a whole slew of policies around how do we get people out in the woods to do the work that needs to be done, because that work is also the work of regeneration and carbon sequestration. If we improve the health of our forests, we improve the health of their uh, carbon cycles, and if we prevent these major massive forest fires, then we are preventing some of the release of that carbon back into the atmosphere. Uh, so for that, um, I'm getting near the end of my time, so I'm not going to go deep into the details of it. But we can look at things like, how do we train people to do that work? How do we help support people who are doing that work? Uh, how do we understand the people who are doing that work are doing it for all of us, and how do we collectively support it? Um, because we could put people to work, we could put every unemployed person in California to work in the next 10 or 20 years to heal our forests, and it would, we would all be the better for it. <laughs> Except then we also need some of them to regenerate our farmlands and our grasslands and our grazing lands. So, um, you know, again, I teach permaculture. I teach people uh, ecological design and restoration and all of these practices. And looking at sort of what do we have, what do we need, doing this assessment. Like, well, half the farmland in North America is due to change hands in the next 10 or 20 years because farmers are aging out. The average age of a farmer is in their 60s. Uh, I know where my land is, up in western Sonoma County, there are lots of older people who need help. Uh, there's lots and lots of land that could be managed, ways to sequester carbon and to grow food and to provide for people's needs. Um, what we need is we need to get it and keep it out of the hands of Monsanto and the poison industrial complex. So for that, we need things like land trusts and community land trusts and investment programs. Um, but we also need the people who can do it. And that requires training and teaching and support and mentoring. So the organization I work with is called Earth Activist Training. We teach permaculture design with a grounding in spirit and a focus on organizing and activism. Uh, we're working on setting up a longer term training program in regenerative land management so that we can help train people and then network with the land trusts and with um, placement services to get people out on the land. And um, yeah. <laughs> and we're looking for funding, support, ideas, any, uh, anything, you know, internship places, apprenticeship places, because most of this program is going to center around not just in class learning things, but being out on the land doing things. So if you have any ideas, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, we have been offering diversity scholarships for the past six or seven years. 
And in doing that, I think we have uh, really in, in changed the demographics of our group and brought some amazing leaders and people of color and people who represent different kinds of diversity into the broader permaculture movement. So I think as a whole in our movement, we need to find ways to support the diversity within the movement that represents the kind of biodiversity we're trying to create in the environment and the ecosystem. Yeah. So just to say, I think with all the challenges we have right now, this is also a time of tremendous opportunity. Um, we need, again, it's a time when we're facing these issues and they are global issues. They're not just local issues. Uh, these are things that are happening all around the world and impacting most heavily the people in the global south and the lesser developed world who had the least responsibility for creating the mess that we're in. So we have to look at those issues and understand how these things are working in other places and how we can have impact and solidarity and support for people who are struggling with these issues in Latin America, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, all over the world. Um, but when we come back to that, you know, the U.S. still has such tremendous power and impact that in some ways I think our main responsibility is right here at home to make the changes that need to be made. So, how many of you are registered to vote? <laughs> Yay. If not, don't wait long, right? You know, I, as somebody who always saw myself as like the wild, radical, anarcho, street activist, I hate to be brought to this position where I'm telling everybody, vote! But we have to, if we can't at least vote, we can't do anything else. And this election coming up is probably the most crucial one we will ever face in our lives. Yeah. So. And we have, in many places, great progressive people to vote for. In other places, we don't have such great creative people to vote for, but vote anyway. Right. You know, vote f you know, for those boring, moderate, <laughs> wishy-washy Democrats, and then push them, <laughs> and then replace them in the next election. But if we don't hold Trump and the Republicans accountable for the mess that they're creating, we are going to slide down into overt, horrific fascism. And that will be a tragedy, not just for us, but for the entire world and for the world of plants and animals and the sacred, as well as for the world of human beings. So. <laughs> I think also we have some great opportunities right now to make connections um, with those people who may have voted for Trump out of just general dissatisfaction with everything that was going on, you know, and to bridge this sort of urban, rural divide. It's one of the places where stuff like farming and grazing, where actually people who think differently about politics actually meet each other and sometimes discover that we may have vastly different political ideas, um, but we share the fact that we care for the land. You know, so I would like to encourage those democratic politicians and those good people out there to start a policy of advocating for an abundant, dignified livelihood for everyone who works the land. Yes? yes. <laughs> because most farmers are not making a living farming, especially small farmers. Big agribusiness, yes, but small guys, most 
People are having to work another job to support their farming habit. And that's not right. If we don't have farmers, we don't have food. And I personally like to eat a lot. So, <laughs> so I just want to end by saying, uh, there's a quote from Bill Mollison that says, "Stupidity, evil is stupidity rigorously applied. <laughs> We have to oppose that wherever we find it, and we have to speak out again for regeneration and for the role that every single person has in bringing us into this amazing transition that I know that we can make. And if we do that, then I believe we will be effective and we will see a new momentum going forward. And I think this is a great time to be alive. <laughs> you know, it's like the climax of the movie. You know, would you want to have missed it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the rail, the train is running down the tracks. And the earth is tied to the tracks. We're all running toward her. Will we get there in time? I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> At least we're not bored. Yeah. <laughs> So um, thank you all. Thank you so much for the work that you are all doing. We have like 10 minutes for questions, like maybe six, seven questions. Please go to the point and so you can mm -hmm. allow other people to, to ask. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for everything that you do. Um, I wanted to highlight something, um, just sort of taking away from what you said. I, I really appreciate what you had to share today. Um, I just want to share with the crowd that I think now is a very critical time to invest in, in a way that is very direct and straightforward. I think our country is in a time that is calling for reparations. And that causes a lot of discomfort with a lot of folks who are the, the majority of people in the environmental movement. Um, the majority of folks in the environmental movement uh, represent the same people who are owning land in this country. It's white male, white cis men dominated. So one thing I wanted to address in taking away from this conference, taking away from everything, um, I think it's, it's beautiful to say let's start something, let's keep plugging in, but at the same time, I think the most impactful thing folks can be doing here today is giving their money to small farmers, people of color in this country, indigenous people in this country, and women and underrepresented folks. So I invite you to speak with me after about this topic if it meets your interest, because putting money where your mouth is and action is the time, this is the time for action. Action speaks louder than words. Action speaks louder than a lot of the things we're doing day to day. And we all have to work. We all have to do what we need to do to survive. But there's a lot that can be done with the people in this space. So I invite you to speak with me. My name's Katie. I live here in San Francisco. And I will hopefully be farming a year from now on a farm that will hopefully be a community land trust run by people of color, where folks can gain skills in the Bay Area and where folks can grow their own food and train others to do the same so that we can grow an autonomous movement where we have ownership over our land, ownership over our resources, and we can build connection in a way that isn't so top-down and isn't reflecting. So rather than investing in something that's going to perpetuate this economic inequality, instead of investing in something that you're going to pass along, the same lineage that gave you the privilege Yes, mm -hmm. the same, yes. Okay, so follow me at Katie Kane, <laughs> um, or speak with me after. I'll be here tomorrow as well. You can recognize me with my hat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. I believe the, uh, the folks at Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York have started a reparations program for African-American black farmers where people can donate to help 
get land in the hands of black farmers. Uh, there's an Ohlone land trust, I think, in the East Bay, again, that people can donate to to get uh, land to restore uh, some of the land to the local people whose traditional territories this is. There are many ways to do that, and I think it's very important. And tomorrow we have Ann Lopez from the Center for Farm, farm Workers Families is going to be speaking here. She's supporting the farmers in, in Hollister and all this area, and she needs a lot of support because she work with people that are farming now and that have been farming for many years and exposed to so many chemicals, agrochemicals. And we're going to have somebody, somebody also from San Quintin. She has been a farmer since she was a little girl, and she's going to talk about what's going on in Baja California with corporations like Driscoll's and the fact that they have had. Do you have some questions, please? Come just to make questions because Next year you can do a presentation, but now we are asking questions. Start what we have here. Mm -hmm. The question to all of us is, why aren't more people here? This, the, what we've heard today is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we need to pull people in that maybe aren't already engaged. That's the question. How are we going to do that? Well, I think that is something we can uh, devote ourselves to coming out of this conference. Uh, it's been amazingly hard to get people to focus on climate change. You know, there are so many issues now, I think, and sometimes they seem much more immediate and pressing than climate change. I think that's one of the problems with it is that it's easy to either see it as something that might happen in the future or something that's happening somewhere else or something that's too big and that you can't really do anything about. I also think um, somebody said earlier, maybe it was Tom Goldtooth, that the people who make policy and even the activists and the people in the progressive movement are basically kind of ecologically illiterate. <laughs> you know, a lot of us grew up in an era, I mean, Ecology wasn't even a word when I was growing up. The first time I ever heard about it was in a science fiction story about time travel sometime, you know, in the 70s. Um, you know, we didn't grow up with that kind of basis of knowledge, and a lot of people just don't get it. So it's a huge work of education. Again, it's a big paradigm shift get people to think relationally rather than instrumentally. Uh, so that's work that we can be doing almost in every conversation. Um, <coughs> and hopefully this is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. Yeah. Your, your uh, ideas today were really profound. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, you kind of had a vision. Mm -hmm. And um, do, do you sometimes feel that themes come back into your life? Because the most inspirational th book I ever read was your book, The Seven mm -hmm. Sacred Ways, uh -huh. uh, about... The Fifth the, Sacred Thing. I think. The, yes, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I've been saying the book. <laughs> Title for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. But I was wondering about how um, you prepared for this today because your ideas were so uplifting and so to the point. Mm. It really inspired me to, to start. Well, doing thank some you. Work. Yeah, I did write a book called The Fifth Sacred Thing back in the 90s that really envisioned. San Francisco transformed into the beautiful, permacultural, culturally diverse, socially just, wonderful place we know it could be. Uh, and unfortunately, Southern California going in the opposite direction. <laughs> and the book centers around what happens when the Southlands invade the North and how you resist, how, how do we resist violence without becoming what we're fighting against? Um, the last couple of years ago, I wrote a sequel to it called City of Refuge that really centers around the question of how do we build the new world when people are so deeply damaged by the old? So 
I feel like the it brought it all back and it made it very fresh for me. And uh, you know, for me, teaching permaculture was kind of the the how-to part of bringing that world about, and as well as doing all the work I've done for 40 years or more in feminist spirituality and ritual and culture building uh, and activism. Um, so yeah, it, things do keep coming around, and sometimes I feel the curse of being an aging activist is you have to fight the same issues over and over and over again, <laughs> hear the same arguments over and over and over again. <laughs> Um, but it's like a spiral. <laughs> and there's always a new generation that's faster than we are that will <laughs> hopefully carry it on and maybe be able to start from a different place than we started from and carry it all further. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much. And thank you to, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Miguel and to all the volunteers and everyone who's helped to organize and make this conference happen. It's really a gift. Thank you. So thank you.